tricks and tips. Look at that. <laughs> I can't juggle, so I had to do something. And then this page, people ask me for a few days here, well, how to get on the list. So that top thing, if you send an email to that address and put help in the body, you will get back instructions as to how to join the list. So then you'll know how to do it, how to get on, how to get off, all that stuff. My web page, if you haven't found it, has file pro tips and tricks. There are, I think, 43 different little things telling you how to do different things in FilePro, how to use printers, how what the environment variables do when you set up a batch file, how to use those, some things about processing, things I always have to answer. I worked for a year as support for FilePro, and there were the kinds of things people always kept asking me about. So I wrote a tip and then set, told them, go look over there. And um, it was a little easier than trying to send them, rewrite it over and over again. So make use of that. My email address is there. Um, if you want to send me a question or something, I just want you to know how to find me. So there's my PowerPoint. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> so you're done? You go home now? <laughs> <laughs> that was it. That was it. Is the okay. first, first trick is to keep it simple. Is that it? it is. It is. <laughs> so like what we want to talk about today, <coughs> I've been working with FilePro since, and I hate to say this, the early 80s. So when I first did classes on, on profile, which is what it was back then, there were 12 commands, 12. I could memorize 12 commands. Mm -hmm. Do what they did in and out, no problem. There are lots more now. And functions, and at key, and system fields, and all that stuff, you can't remember all that. So what the first thing I'm gonna say is if you haven't done it lately, open up your manual, and just browse through the, just go through the commands. Every time I look in there, I find a command and I say, oh, I could have used that. I forgot it was in there. Take the time, look through there, put notes in it, write it down, try them. This is how you expand your knowledge because when you first looked at that command, maybe it wasn't helpful. You looked at it and go, I'll never use that. I don't care about that. But you'll look back and you'll have another situation. You'll have new programming things you need to do. And maybe that command will be, oh, I've been trying to figure out how to do that. And here it is, right in FilePro. So make use of those tools. Use the manual. Go back and look again and again. You will pick up things every time. I am always amazed when I look in there and go, where did this come from? So that's my first important tip. The second thing we're going to talk about now here, as we move forward, is processing. Now we all know the if-then part of it, but FilePro has gotten very complex. And we're going to look at some of the ways that things flow in there and how you can build programming. Because I run into programmers and they look at a job and they go, oh my god, this is just so much, I don't think I can manage it. But FilePro has event triggers. I call them event triggers. They call them object code, however you put it. And the, the, what they mean is, you can write little snips of program. When I, put, when I put data in this field, I need to do this. When I go down here, I need to do this. So when I'm building a process table, I've laid out a screen, and I sit there, and I go through the fields. Do I have to do something special here? Coming into the field, going out of the field, do I have to set up a browse? So I just keep building all those, until I maybe get to a place where I say, well, this is too much stuff for just one wind leaving. I gotta add something to input processing. And I throw a little code in there. So you just go through this little by little and that's how you build a project. It makes it, and when you're looking at a project in small little bits like that, it's much easier to solve all those little problems. You will find that. So let's look at some processing. Let's see, I'm gonna sit down because it's easier to run a keyboard when you're sitting next to it. Now the first thing is to understand how file pro programming works. And I know a lot of you experience, but I know there's a few people in here that haven't used file pro very much yet. So I wrote this to learn better how file pro goes through things. Now all it is is a little message box that pops up 
every time it goes into any event processing. So when you first hit File Pro in data entry mode, this is telling me it's running once processing, at once. Okay? So if you need to tell File Pro something, do something, this is where you can put it at the beginning. Now this would be an overall kind of thing, because you're not sitting on a record, you're not locking a record, you're in cyber, you know, you're in that play, no man zone before records are even hit. So you can put something in there, you can ask questions, you got that first place. Now I have, I am at app menu, and you notice this doesn't look like file pros menu. I made my own menu. So I could give to a customer as more specific what they need to do. I can make it say, uh, browse by last name. I can make it say, um, go find today's invoices, or add an invoice, or subtract an in, you know, whatever different things you need to do for your customer. It doesn't have to be file pros record selection menu. So now I can build this. Menu works. I'm still not sitting on a record. I'm still in that no record zone, so I'm not going to lock any records. I could browse from here if I wanted. If I pick this selection here, it's going to put me right on index, the index that I selected. I can put a name in, and I can push enter, and I can go to a record. Okay, now what's running next? Automatic processing. Automatic processing is the, what we had back from the beginning to tie the records together, to tie the, to tie the uh, front to, the, you know, this to this. It, you put in a little setup stuff. Automatic processing doesn't lock records either. You should never put a write in an automatic process. Unless something's changed, that's not where you do writes. You might load it. Say this would be where I would put, um, say I had a file which had a customer account number but not any other information about the customer. I would put a lookup in there that would go fetch all that information into a set of dummy variables like I like to use ZA, ZB, ZC, you know, EFG, put in the customer's name and address, and then any report I print or any screen I display that I need some of that information on, I just use those variables and they'll always work. If you're consistent on the way you use ZA, ZB, ZC, and all your tables, this is perfect because now you have one place you programmed it and you don't have to think about it anymore. You just stop, drop the variables wherever you want. Okay? So that's what automatic, you can do calculations, you can add things up and maybe put, maybe you figure the percentage out from two numbers that are sitting in the data or maybe, you know, whatever kind of things. But you put a dummy field on the screen and it shows up and that's what you put, put in there. And I see a lot of programming. I've seen a lot of applications over the year from other programmers. Some people don't understand what automatic is for, so they don't use it. You can do a lot of that same stuff in Ensel. Now, Ensel wasn't there a long time ago, but it is now. So you, have, you can do some of that stuff because that also runs before the screen's displayed. Um, another thing automatic can do is it can switch screens. So um, I have an application where I had salesmen and they were looking at a tickler file and they didn't want Salesman A to be able to look at Salesman B's stuff. So I had a little logic. They would, I would know which salesman was logged in, goes into the data, and if he had a record that was for the other guy, I would put up a screen that says, no, no, you're not allowed to see this, or you could pop into someplace else, or something like that. So you could actually make distinctions and show people certain screens if they are <coughs> the right person to see that stuff. So it could be an auditing kind of situation. It could be payroll where you don't want people to see other people's payroll, things like that. You could make some distinctions and show them other screens. So that's what you can do with automatic. Okay, so now I'm hitting Ensel. Ensel is, you can use it to change the prompts at the bottom. If you notice, I don't have the normal file pro prompts <coughs> at the bottom of my screen. I changed them got rid of the other ones. <coughs> so this is the kind of stuff you do in Ensel, and to make that right, you have to change, you have to change the flags on your command line when you're going into File Pro to tell File Pro not to try to help you and put their prompts down there. Easy to do. Everybody, you probably all know how to do that, right? So anyway, so we're Ensel. 
And now I'm at the prompts at the bottom. Okay, if I update, watch this, automatic runs again to make sure nothing changed while I was gone, sitting down there at Edsel. And now I, I at update runs. If you have an at update, you can do things before you give them screen control. So again, you could you could keep you could put somebody on a screen where they can only view and not be able to update. So if they if they don't have security permission to update, but you want them to be able to view, you can have two screens that have the same fields. One's all protected, one's not. So you could give them a view, put a little show, push enter to continue kind of thing, and then head them off when you're there, push enter. So you got these choices and these different parts of the processing that File Pro is designed for us give us the tools to build something pretty easy that has all that power and control. So now I'm going into field one. So I'm entering field one. I can do something now. And now I'm up on a date. Now this just kind of goes, you see, when leaving field one, um, I have a wildcard. If you didn't know when processing can use wildcards, what that means is instead of saying at when leaving two, at WEF2, you can put a star instead of the two. Now the star means file pro do this on any when leaving field that doesn't already have its own. Okay, so if there's no when leaving two in my process table, this general one will, will work. And the way I use that in a lot of processes is to clear any prompts at the bottom that might have been left over from the last. So when you enter a field, I might put a thing at the bottom, be sure you, you know, your choices are this, you know, do this, little prompts for that field. And then when I leave, I want to clean them off. So the next field doesn't see the leftovers. So maybe on the when entering star, I clean up, and I don't have to write one for every little field. It saves me trouble. You can do that with any of the W, at W logic. You can do at when help, at when UK, at when leaving, at when entering, all those, all those events <coughs> specific to fields, all you can use wildcards. And that's just a star, okay, so. All right, so now I'm in field two. Now you know you can walk through the screen. I'm just gonna hit escape. All right, let me try browse. My function can. So there, wildcard, I'm doing a browse. Now you also can pick up, and I had it display, if you notice, key press, D-M-A-P, okay? That's the value of add SK. So and when they put, push browse, this is more helpful with at W-U-K, when, you hit a user key. And those are multiple. I'll try that one next. But you can use you can use I think there were four keys that function in that in that option if I remember right. And so you can split, you can say push this key, but if you push F4, it does one thing. If you push F5, it does another. So you can pick up different keys and actually give yourself four more options at the bottom is what you can do when leaving. So not just browsing, you can use app when you key to do a bunch of other stuff. So that's kind of handy. Okay, when leaving, <laughs> go here. So you notice I did, I did that. All right, so let, let's do F8. F8, I get DPRT in add SK. So I can say when UK3, if add SK is equal to DPRT, do this. Yeah. Okay. You see, you see my little wild card thing. How it, you know, and this is all. I just, these are not big programming th feats. What I managed here, but I was just trying to show you how it all works together. Okay. So if I go back now, I'm going to hit. That was F8. <coughs> I'm going to hit F9. See what happens. Now I have. I left W, UK3 still, but now. The add SK is equal to GRAF. So I can say, okay, if it's equal to GRAF, do this. Okay? All right. I'm going to escape now. We'll go and uh, you'll see this. Now I'm, I'm again leaving. I have a wild card when leaving for free. Now it's going to do the beginning of my input table, which is a screen flip. 
with me on screen too. I made it a lot of different colors so you wouldn't think I was cheating and I was still on the same screen. Okay, so now I'm going back to field one. I'm going to just escape. We don't have to review all those again. So now I'm saving screen two and I'm doing automatic on an, so automatic ran at the beginning and it's going to run on the way out. And now I'm running Ensel and I'm back to the prompts. So just doing that one record flow, I ran all <coughs> kinds of little bits of programming. Powerful tools. Now I'm going to push a couple things I have at the prompts at the bottom. We're going to try P for pop-up. So I have a little routine. I had it at key P. So this was a little routine that now at key P works logically just like input processing. Okay? It's going to pick up and end the same way as input processing. It's just like an alternate input processing. So whatever you tell it to do, it's going to behave the same way. It's going to have the same starts and ends. Okay, so I, I popped up a little screen. I push escape. I don't want to go through all the wind, leaving and enter. And so it, it ran automatic. It did all that stuff and went back to the prompts. Which event did you trap at key P? Well, there's, I just put a message box. So at key P, say I had all kinds of little things I wanted to be able to accomplish, separate little things with this piece of data. So at key P was just a letter I picked and I, when you push it, it tells it to do something different than what the normal thing. Is that if you in notice, the input processing table? Or where is yeah, that it's in the add input processing. It's a label in the input processing table that you add. You start it, you end it. It ends with the same kinds of commands input would end with, end, exit, um, like that. So you know when you're done. Win processing, I didn't mention this, and if you didn't know it, win has some peculiar ways it ends. If you put a screen command up, it ends. If you do end of ends it, you have to be careful. You can't go when leaving a field and put three or four screen commands and it's not going to go from screen to screen to screen. Once you hit the first one, you're done. So that's, it's intended for just processing a field. So you've got to keep track. So if your when processing does a go sub, go back to the when processing with a return and then end. Don't expect it to end in the go sub. And do, if it doesn't finish, you're going to get errors down the road. Eventually, you're going to get a return without go sub or some other freaky thing happening. And then also remember that the add key function will lock the record. So that if you well, add key is input processing. So if you're updating, you're locking, you're working in a live mode. So, okay. So there, and I have a menu option here. Now this is going to run. A thing now this one let's see where I'm gonna go so that just was a way to start there's an at menu so I have an at key M and you push it and it does whatever you want so you can pop up a little menu you can put the menu command there and give them choices maybe you don't have enough room down at the bottom for all the things they could do they are just overwhelmed with options so you could make a little M push menu they get a little menu like the selection menu when you put it up and then you could do whatever else you need to do. You have help, and that, and this one, I have an at key H. Now File Pro comes with a built-in help, but that's only some different things. If you want this to do something better or different or override that, remember, if you put, if I make an at key H, I don't have hard copy because hard copy is the prompt that's normally down here. I've overridden it. If I put an at key X, guess what's going to happen? <laughs> you don't have an X anymore to get out. If I do an at key B, I'm overriding the browse logic that's normally there with my logic, which is, that one could be helpful. The X one, watch out for. <laughs> you'll, have, you'll have to hit the corner X and then the thing to get out and then go fix it because you don't want that like that. The order of processing would be uh, at or at cell, automatic, and then it would be watching at key, any at key process. Right, it would search for that if you're putting, now here I have a delete, okay? So I can override the delete. So if I want, if I'm in a file where 
I, I often in my programming, and I shouldn't give this out, instead of, I'll have it say, uh, do you want to delete yes or no? But I won't respond to yes. I'll respond to an exclamation point. And that's so idiots don't delete things they shouldn't. Um, so I, or sometimes I'll sneak that in where uh, people don't know it's at. You know, they'll look and I'll have yes. You know, add, update, delete, but delete isn't even on the list and the exclamation point will delete. So you can, you can use some of this, do things that are sneaky that way. Okay, so delete. And now here I hit delete, so it did automatic. So this is deletion override. If it exists, it will execute instead of the normal delete function that's down at the bottom. And I can put a question in. This is what I, I, I do not recommend proceeding or however you want to word it, continue, yes or no. I can say yes and it will delete the record. It's running automatic again and there's the record's gone. So that was a valid delete. So. In some cases, it's helpful to use an unusual character so they don't fly too fast past something <coughs> and answer it without thinking. Okay, so that's data entry, and that's a good thing. When you add, it's pretty much the same thing. You're going through the same logic. I think in the add mode, you don't get automatic at the front. You're only at the back. That's the only difference. So. Have you all mastered input processing? <laughs> now, I did add one thing yesterday because I didn't know this was a possibility at exit. So I saw this yet, I said, oh, I gotta put that one in. So when I'm leaving, I can make something happen. <clears throat> Maybe I'll make fireworks go off or something. Yeah, it's a good thing you're out of here. Go home. <laughs> That's the equivalent to at update? Which one? At exit. No, at exit happens when you push X at the bottom of the screen or control C when you're down in Ensel. So it's 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 the equivalent of that of Ensel, of, of leaving. Leaving, yeah. It's your it's it's when you're wanting to get out of the records. That's the best place I can do it. Where's the Ensel at Ensel process? You put it in your input table. Okay. Can you show it the table? Yeah, I will. I'll pull it up. Now that now that I kind of walked you through this, is, uh, this we can go back and I can pull the table up. Yeah, you clear your robo form update. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> or full screen. Yeah, I, I'm not entirely online. Okay, so I didn't let it do anything. Um, I probably can. Let's see. This um, I've been trying to deal with this silly laptop and get better options here. Is that bigger? Yeah. Oh, wait, it didn't apply <coughs> Is that bigger? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it kind of fits there. All right. Can everybody see that better? Okay, processing. <coughs> Thank you. That's better. I think that. the one we want. Good question. Just, do you guys add like control S, control L for the dot screens like it works in Unix to resize the screen? Is S is smaller, L is bigger? That's the terminal emulator, not for the yeah, that's not, screen. Not that's not, uh, okay, so let's page down through this. All right, so this is really all I had here was just at when help, at when leaving, at when H with the little prompts to just show you that I had, had hit an event that I triggered with keystrokes. You can build that programming up. Here's Ensel with the shows at the bottom of the screen to line up things. Now, I like to put the enter selection and the record number and that stuff on there so it looks like file pro screen bottom. Yep. And it's nice like that. But you could, if you don't like people to know the record number, you could not put that or the screen number if you want to put some other information there. So at, at, at when HP1, that's if help is pressed in field one? Yes. If help is pressed in field one. Or you could say star. Now let me, if you didn't know, 
you have add FD. See right in the middle of my message box? I have add FD. Add FD is the field number you're on. So I could put logic in, and I've seen this done when you have uh, processing that is huge. I've seen programmers have a wildcard at when whatever. When you go into it, it says, okay, you're in field number one. They do a call to a subroutine <coughs> that processes field number one. And then it comes back. Now, that, what that gives you is you, you don't have competition with variables. It's a little bit easier. I mean, in a sense, it's easier to manage if you can go down your table. And they would name their very, the process tables W underscore the field number or a couple of letters in the field number so that you could look in the process list and easily know that this is when entering field one and this is when leaving field one. So you could go and edit just little snippets of processing and they weren't in a huge table. Now, we have a lot more power with FilePro nowadays. We've struggled with memory issues on older machines and this was one of the solutions. I don't know if it's a good one for you, but it it's works, it works. You can, a call command can be can be a string. So you can figure out what the name is in logic and say, is this existing? If it is, I can call to it. I would always do it and exist. Check it and make sure there was one before you send it off someplace. So you have possibilities to build your table logically. I was going to get to this a little later, but while I'm talking about it, when I do calls with my logic, I start the table names with the C underscore. Because when I look at them later, I know that isn't for a report. I know it's a, intended to be a call. It's structured like a call. It behaves like a call. I do N underscore for chains. Chains behave differently than calls. They have different logic. They, they do different things. They have different limitations and structures. So you need to know which ones you're doing so that you don't logically <laughs> mess up. <laughs> Um, if you're using a call for a win processing leaving, remember a screen command locks, shuts it off. You're at the end. <coughs> so if you issue a screen command, it's going to go back even though you didn't hit end. So that's why you need to know the difference, which one you're in, so you know what to do right to make it finish correctly. How do you check for the exists before you do the call? You, you build a path name to where the process table should be. Okay, okay, so you check the, the file yeah. exists. Okay. Yeah, right. so you're checking to see if it exists. So, you, you know, you'd have, I, I would put in that once <laughs> processing at the beginning a variable that would give you your path to your file pro location and then just tack on a file name a dummy. Okay, yeah. and um, PRC or file, or, you know, <coughs> dot PRC depending on what operating system you're on. Okay, so a uh, page down through this. this is, so it's, this is not tricky. This menu command, if you haven't used it before, you, you use an array. The first element in the array is the heading. It's two, three, four, five are the elements of your menu. And you can make as big as you want. And then you get this, this down here is an on go to logic. The menu, the name of the list, and then it goes to one, two, three, that, that's the label in your processing table that you're sending it to. And it goes there and it's a, it's a go-to. It does not come back. You go and do whatever you do there. So if you look down in my processing, so I, there's one, two, three, and then there's a gone because that's what happens if you push X on the menu. Did I get, did I get too far? So on one, one was add records, if you remember. What I did was I pushed key three. Now, in your mind, picture file pros record selection menu, yeah. which is what you're overriding with that menu command. So if I was on the real file pro menu, to get it to go to add records, I pushed three. So that's what it what made the three work. If I was if I was on a real FilePro <coughs> record selection menu and I wanted to go to 
index selection, index number A, like that, or whatever, I would push 4 for index selection, and then A for the index I want. Right? And then you would type. You would get the screen where you type in your name, or whatever your index is. So, in, so in, for 3, all I had to do is push 4 and A. So that File Pro did what it thought its real menu was there and did what the keystrokes told it to do. You would work Ensel logic. If you put a menu up in Ensel, you would work it the same way. So if I was in Ensel, Ensel's at the bottom of a record. So how would you get to add records from the bottom of a, an existing record? What keys would you push? You would be updating the record you're on. How would X you get three. to add X a new three. record? X, X and three. then 3. So that's what you would push if you were in Ensel and wanted to send them back to adding records. So just picture in your mind, real file pro, it's still back there. All you're doing is changing the front end when you do these menus, when you put prompts down at the bottom. If you, if you put prompts at the bottom and you didn't do something with B or list B and they push B, it's still going to browse. Because it's still back there, no matter what you said in the front. So at Ansel does go in the input processing. At Ansel is in your input processing. It does not work in reports. It has no, it has no place there. So at update, you get all this stuff in here. Let's see, menu. Um, so this is this, and this is the the logic. So I usually have my input table at the top um, of my logic, my table, and then when it gets down to the end of input, I'm at an end, and then it would do go back to Ensel, and I would move to the next record, or I would be adding another record, whatever whichever path I'm in, whether I'm in add or update mode. I hope this isn't all too simple for all. You've all mastered all this, right? Years ago. Years ago. Okay. Well, I, I hope so. I just, sometimes a little refresher. Okay. So anyway, so that's logic in File Pro and how you can build and, you know, go through this. So uh, I want to show one more. I have another flow here. Let's go back. Is there a difference between at update and at QU? At update is File Pro's built-in update offering. I think it runs, I think it also runs in add records. I'm pretty sure it does. At you, you wouldn't run when you're adding records. I think that's the difference if I remember right. So if you add, if you add records, it goes to the at key you? If, if you are adding records, if you have logic in at update, it would execute. So you could control, maybe if somebody's allowed to add records, or you know, you could do some controlling thing, and that happens before the screen data entry is, is presented. Okay, if you did add QU, that would only trigger because it's not special to File Pro. If you hit a U and you're in and you're in update mode. So it has a different, a little bit different logical That's flow a in there. Different spot. Okay. okay, so the other one I wanted to show you, and this, this just to fill it all out, because we just did input, um, I didn't cover the chain and calls. Now chains, in effect, throw away the input table you're working on and give you an entire new table to work on. Okay? If you go from, a, if you chain to another table, it starts at the top as if it's fresh. When you end that chain and maybe try to go back, you chain back to input and you're starting at the top again. It's not like a call. With a call, you go out and you come back from where you left. So if you call, it's like a subroutine where you, you know, go and do a return and come back. So when you call somewhere, and do a little subroutine. When you're done with that and you exit it, you're going to come back into, into your processing right where you left, and the logic will continue. So that's the difference. So in, again, in the olden days when memory was less, was more difficult, or 
because we didn't have declared long variables, you would find situations where you ran out of variables. Or they were getting too confusing because you had so many in use and you needed to do something so different that you needed to start over. So that's where a chain would come into. You would get to a, you would say, okay, I need to do this now. Okay, I throw away everything I know already and I go into the chain and I'm good. Now, automatic processing back there would pass variables. So if you define variables in automatic that were global, they would pass from the input to the chain. Declared variables have that capability in the way you declare them. So you would declare, do we all use, how many here use long variables? How many don't? Okay. When they put those in, I stopped using dummies. I mean, I have a hard time putting a dummy variable in a process table anymore. I just, I, it, I look at it and go, what the heck is, am I doing? And I just make it longer. Pardon me? Except for screens and forms, right? Screener reports. Okay. And you got to use dummies on Well, you know, what displays on the screen and what prints on a report, you need dump to put them in the output. That's what you meant. Okay. Yeah. You're right. So there's where you put them into those kind of variables. But for logic, long variable names. So when you declare the long variable, you say global so that you can push it over into any other table you go to. And over there you say declare extern and that picks it up. You don't give it a length or in this, in this destination, it's just picked up. So we'll talk about some of that a little more. I've, so I've seen some very fancy ways this all can use and you can flow them in from one thing to the next. Um, so it's kind of cool. But we won't go through the flow file for the chain. I just added more capabilities. Okay, I want to do this one here. We're not, we're, we're, we want to cover a lot of stuff, so. Okay, scan table. Now, output processing is where you're trying to do something to a lot of records, usually. Okay, so you have a couple things that need to happen. You need to find the records you want and you need to sort them so the report is reasonable. You can make sense out of it. So scan processing is a process table that you put on your command line with a minus V in front of it, and it will run through and pick which records you want and sort them if you've given commands in there to pick and sort. So it could be, it could be doing one or the other, or both things. Usually it's, I, in mine, it's both. But you can use file pros selection process by putting a minus S selection table. So say my selection says active, and I've defined active customers. I could put a minus S active, and then still have a scan table that picked all the people that, whose names start with M for some god awful reason or everybody in a certain zip code. I wouldn't have to define that they're active in the scan table that was inherent in the selection because it selects first out of the selection, then it runs the scan table on who's ever left. And then if I selected them in the scan table or if I didn't bother selecting and active was enough selection, then it could sort them and then it runs output on all those records. Okay, so let's watch this go. So I have a scan table running now, I, if I hit N, it selects none, so I'm just, I'm, I'm going to just, record two, I hit, okay, I re selected two records, so there we go. Form processing is executing, so now I'm re executing the output part of this. And that's a little report. Post print, right up on the screen. Okay, so you can use your tables. Scan processing is a lot friendlier to a client, to an end user, <laughs> than teaching them how to use selection tables. You can use, I have seen people use data entry. Okay, so you go into a data entry screen, a database you've designed, 
It asks all the questions. You put answers in there. Scan processing looks up the record and can run reports from that data you entered in a friendly data entry screen. You could do you could do a system report call out of that data entry screen and run the report right from that data. I tend to, I have a, one customer that runs these god awful reports that have all kind of selection information that he has to put in. So we actually give each one of the reports a name in this database. He fills them in and then he can run, he can indicate when he's running the report which one of those data entry screens he wants to use as a selection. So you can make a lot of options, use File Pro, you can do lookups from a scan table, you can go look, figure out things, you can go, so I'm in an invoice file, I want to print everything for one customer, maybe I need to ask what his name is, go figure out his account number so I know what to select. The data isn't here where I am, I have to go get it. Or I want to sort on something that isn't live in the current file, that's how you do it with scan tables. Now, one of the things people asked me for years, and I guess maybe this isn't so much fun anymore, is lookup dash. In a scan table, lookup dash, have you, are you familiar with lookup dash? Okay. Lookup without a file name in a dash instead is looking up to a record in the current file. But file pro doesn't just look there, it goes there. So if you're trying to go, say you want to print invoice number 8,224 and your invoice number start at 1, you do not want to select until you find 8,224. You would like to do lookup dash, go straight to that record number by an index and print it and then say get out of here. But you, then you jump to the end of the index and you're done. So you've looked at three records. Can you imagine how much faster that is than looking at 8,234,000 records? It's, I mean, the systems are getting faster, so maybe this isn't so helpful, but it was always a wonderful tool. There is a tip on my webpage that gives you all the parameters how to set that up. Okay, so now I didn't put, so the report levels, we've got <coughs> windbreak programming. So if you picture a real report in FilePro, you have headings, you have detail lines, you have subtotal section possibilities, you have grand totals. There are event processing for every one of those, and I've, they've added starting a windbreak, ending a windbreak, you got, you got the whole thing happening down there. So you have a lot of power in them, those event processes for reports. I think so. Anything anybody wants to ask about just the general processing stuff we just 